Welcome to the Wealth Management Version 2.0, the Advice Tech Revolution podcast, where I'm joined by Anders Jones, co-founder and CEO of Facet Wealth. And by way of background, there are a lot of podcasts out there focused on advisors, helping advisors, and fintech, which is awesome. This one's a little bit different. Here, we're focused on the business of the business, the business of advice. And specifically, we study and celebrate firms that are leveraging the combination of technology and humanity to deliver better advice to more people, better outcomes for more people through that combination. I call that the advice tech revolution, and Anders is on the front lines of that revolution. Since I stumbled upon Anders and Facet Wealth a few years back, I think, Anders, we met at at an industry conference uh, where you were with one of your RIA partners, if I recall, and you had acquired the small end, the mass affluent end of their book, which was not a core focus of theirs, as it is with, with many RIAs. And for you, that was a way to acquire clients that were in your target profile um, in one fell swoop. Um, I believe that's continued to be, be a way that you grow your business. We'll get into that. Um, but why don't you give our listeners and viewers a little bit of your background? Give us the Facet Wealth origin story. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, big fan of uh, your weekly newsletter. Get a lot of insights out of that. I always think that the uh, the analysis that you do is, is uh, pretty unique and interesting. So uh, excited to be able to join you and talk a little bit about what we're up to. Um, as far as our origin story goes, so my quick background is uh, grew up in Boston, went to school in California, went to Stanford undergrad, graduated in 2009. So With the exception of this year, probably the worst time to graduate uh, in recent memory, although I I think this year might have outdone us. (laughs) Um, And so, uh, you know, what do you do when 75% of your class doesn't have a job? You join a startup. So so I was on the early team of a company called LiveRamp, which is uh, in the advertising technology space. And, um, and we sold it to Axiom in 2014, I think, and subsequently got spun out as a uh, now public company. Um, but after that, I was doing some uh, early stage angel and seed investing and got very interested in what was going on in the wealth management market. This was the 2015 timeframe. So um, the robo-advisors were starting to really get yeah. traction and raise really large venture capital rounds. And the real sort of impetus for FACET was that the, uh, the DOL fiduciary rule. So it was clear from all the venture activity in, uh, in FinTech that there were some big changes and trends happening um, with a move towards more digital advice and uh, in particular DIY advice. And then the DOL rule came out And uh, the industry pushback was if you have, if you pass this rule, you're going to have 8 million clients who lose their advisor relationship because the advisor can't afford to both service them and act in their best interest at the same time. So that was when the light bulb went off and said, wow, so you have a bunch of people who have already opted into working with a human advisor and they're not going to the sort of DIY robo solutions. Um, but the cost of servicing them, the industry's cost of servicing those those clients is too high unless you put really crazy fees on top of what you're doing for them. And so that was sort of the, the light bulb moment to start FACET, which was this industry has a cost problem. And if we can build technology to lower the cost of human-based advice, there's already a willing and ready market there that has opted in. And, um, and, and that seems like a very valuable company to build, not just in the purely economic sense, but in the sense that we could actually really help a lot of people who, who need the help. And so that's kind of what, we, what we've done. That's, that's what we've built. We, um, you know, our, our whole approach is that segment of people that are, have more complexity and nuance in their financial lives than a, a DIY solution is really built for, but at the same time, don't have the asset level that's interesting to a traditional advisor acting in a purely fiduciary capacity. Fantastic, and I couldn't agree more. So I'm a uh, a big fan of this space. Um, Been uh, promoting it too, to a lot of my enterprise clients for for a while. Um, Now, unfortunately, we had this this catalyst, this inflection point around COVID and lockdown. And so now everyone is is scrambling to to, uh, build out what you've already done 
Uh, we had recently, we had personal capital, another firm, you know, different model, but some similarities in terms of uh, remote advisors lever leveraging technology. So we had that uh, uh, sale for a billion dollars uh, recently. So all eyes are on this. Everyone's saying, how do I, how do I accelerate that? Y you've been through it. So we know it's not that easy. Uh, it's not just saying, okay, now you're conducting your business through uh, Zoom and, and, and WebEx with clients. There's a whole business model around uh, the model. And, and so talk to me about that. And specifically, you mentioned building out the technology. And that, so that's one of the areas that is really interesting to me that you didn't, you've got some third party partners for areas that you decide didn't make sense for you to build out, but you did build out quite a bit um, or, organically. So kind of t talk to me about that whole process and, and, and that approach. Sure. So let me start with a general observation about kind of where we are as an industry six months into 2020. I think if you rewound to January and said, here's what the world's going to look like six months from now, I, I don't think anyone would have believed you. Right. But the, the, way, the best way that I describe it is that the last six months has really accelerated the future um, of, you know, five years from now is now today. Right. And so I think that there were a lot of sort of nebulous ideas about, yeah, in the future, there's going to be a heavy focus on virtual client experience and enabling this idea of working from home or working from anywhere. And these are all sort of like great things that we will get to eventually. And now we're, we're in a world where you have to be doing these things. Right. Um, and I think it's interesting. I think there's kind of two sides to the same coin, especially on the virtual side of things. One is that clients are now looking across industries for virtual delivery of service. That's become their default expectation. And so I think the days of a brick and mortar office for a lot of the sort of knowledge work, which I would put our industry in, um, are, are over from a, a client facing standpoint. At the same time, <clears throat> talent has always been a hot topic in this industry and how do you sort of you know, tap into the next generation of talent and companies that aren't equipped to enable a work from home or work from anywhere environment are really going to be left behind and are really going to struggle with um, recruiting talent. Right. And, you know, you sort of said, asked about our, our starting point and, and, you know, that we're, we've been doing this for a while, you know, yes, we are. So we started in 2016 and from day one, we were a virtual first company. So we have an office uh, in Baltimore. We, Total, our company is about 150 people. We have maybe 35 work in the office in Baltimore, and the rest are virtual and work from home. And so, uh, in particular, our CFPs, uh, which has allowed us to hire out of the national labor pool of CFPs, which has been great for us and really allowed us to hire the the best talent that's out there. Um, we, uh, but but we designed our our culture and our sort of way of working from day one to support virtual work. And I think that companies that are now sort of scrambling to figure out how to do that, there are a lot of things to take into account that um, if you haven't optimized it for previously, there's going to be some, some growing pains. And I think that the world is sort of divided into two groups. Now there's the people who are playing defense and trying to just tread water. And then there are people who are embracing this and saying, okay, we're going all virtual for the next, you know, and say until there's a vaccine or whatever the, you know, whatever that sort of point in the, in the future is. And so, you know, we're going to lean into this and really make it work. So, um, so, th so I think there's, there's going to be a lot of movement in the industry. I would imagine there's going to be a lot more M and A as companies sort of sort into self sort into who's virtual first, who's not, who can, who has the tech inf infrastructure to support virtual work and virtual uh, service delivery. So it's going to be really interesting to see how that all, how that all shakes out. Absolutely. And so on the technology side, let's spend a couple minutes on that. Tell me about your, you know, as, as you were getting this up and running and figuring out your, your plan, how did you decide on what your tech stack had to look like, what you would outsource versus, versus develop internally? Sure. So going back to our kind of founding aha moment around the cost issue, um, our whole approach to the tech that we've built is how do we make our planners more efficient. So it reduces the time per client and then reduces the cost to the end client. So that looks like basically increasing the number of clients that a, a planner can work with. And if you think about sort of, you know, going at a level deeper, what that looks like, 
today, if you're an average CFP, you're probably spending about three hours of prep time for every hour of client facing time. And a lot of that is very low value added right. uh, work. You're going into different systems, you're pulling a bunch of data, you're compiling it into some report or some deliverable for the client. You're taking notes maybe on a yellow pad and then transcribing it. There's a lot of stuff that, that goes on that really centers around the movement of data and the normalization of data between systems. So our whole approach is how do we get that, that three hours of non-client facing time as close to, to zero as possible? And so for us, it all starts with our database, right? So, so we've constructed sort of a, our own CRM and then we build tools on top of the CRM that basically uh, make for very easy movement of data back and forth so the advisor doesn't even have to think about it. So all the notes are taken in the app, all the uh, plans are built in the app, all the, um, the, the recommendations that, that advisors make are, are pre-populated, the agenda tools are, are in the app. Um, and so the idea is that, that any, anything related to sort of the creation of deliverables or calculations on behalf of the client lives in, in one place. Um, the, the stuff that we haven't built is, are, are things like account linking. So we use uh, a combination of Plaid and a couple others to, uh, to link accounts. And you know, those, those pipes are already built. And so not, not something that we, we don't need to reinvent the wheel there. No. Um, secure file storage box does that very well. We don't need to reinvent that. Um, and that's basically it. I mean, we, um, you know, we, and then, you know, we use sort of all the usual internet backbone stuff like, you know, Google for all of our internal, uh, uh emails and, and, uh, internal drive Slack for communication. AWS is where we host all our data. So, um, but, but yeah, I mean, it's interesting when you're a tech company, you have to think about, what are the things that you can do better than anyone else versus what are the things that you can rely on other people to do better than you? And then you always have to sort of make these build by decisions. Yeah. And while it's, it's nominally sexy to own the whole stack, there are certain things that if you sort of double down on your own expertise and advantage, that's where real value gets created. Right. So you gave me a, a thousand jumping off points. Um, yeah. Let's start with, let's talk about the client. So, um, ultimately the, the aim, as you said, is to serve more clients that, that are, they've shown an affinity to getting advice somewhere. Uh, they don't want to be purely do it yourself. Um, so what, what, what does that profile of a, of a, of a, I'm sure you got more than one profile, but if you could generalize, what does, what's an average facet wealth household look like? I'll give you the, the non-obvious answer, which surprises people, which is that the median client that we have is 55 years old. Okay. So most people would think, oh, FinTech, tech forward company, you're probably serving millennials. And we do have a fair share of those. I think one of the things we didn't talk about earlier is that our model, our, our pricing model is subscription based. So we don't charge uh, based on assets, we charge a, a, an annual subscription that's really tied to the complexity of the, the client's case. So we look at how much time we're going to be spending with them, what level of resources are going to require on our end, and then we, we price it accordingly. So we think that that really aligns value with cost in a very fair and transparent manner and also makes us unconflicted. How, let me interrupt you on that, how in that early discovery phase, how do you probe and, and get a sense of what it's going to take to manage that client? So we have a three-step onboarding process where we actually have three conversations with a client before we, before we, we sign them. And one of those is we call it a goal review, but it's a, it's a deep dive into what are the client's goals and what are the things that are top of mind for the client. But then also we put our fiduciary lens on and say, okay, what are the things that you're probably not thinking about? Um, I'd say the two biggest ones that people aren't thinking about are risk management, so various forms of insurance, and then also uh, trust and estate things. Um, the very sort of unsexy things, uh, parts of, of financial planning. Um, and so, so we sort of look at, combine those two points of view, and then that, that's how we inform what the, what, what the, the level of services that the client's going to need. And there's a lot more complexity to it than that, but that's, that's the high level of how it works. Do you find, if you look at some of your clients, the, the, the longest tenured clients that you monitor that and you might adjust it on an annual basis or is it pretty 
is that process pretty pretty strong where it, it follows that path we we look at it and we we're, we're a very data heavy company and analytics heavy company as you might imagine so we look at on sort of a unit level from a client standpoint what are what are um you know are, are we are we sort of achieving what the client needs and how much time are we spending doing? Are we way overshooting or way undershooting? And, um, and so, you know, occasionally we'll reprice a client and that can go in, in either direction, but I'd say for the most part, it's a, it's a fairly steady state. Um, so, but I, I brought the pricing up to, to comment on the millennial clients that we serve. We work with a lot of folks that don't have any significant asset base. And in some cases actually have negative net worth that they have, student debt, but our high earners, the, the Henry's, right? The high earners not rich yet and can afford to pay an annual fee. And it definitely makes sense for them to do that. But a traditional advisor would be hard pressed to work with them because they don't have any assets. So, um, but that being said, our, our sort of meeting client is 55. So if you think about it, if you have, and, and our, and our meeting client has about $400,000 of investable net worth. Okay. Um, and, and a lot of that is typically tied up in a 401k. So again, difficult for an advisor to, to fee off of. So if you think about it, 55 year old client has at $400,000 is kind of probably are, is pretty fairly close to the peak in terms of what their asset level is going to be. So, you know, for a traditional advisor looking at it, that's not a great client to service fees. There's not a lot of upside left there for them. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, arguably in the most complex time in their financial life, right? There's uh, kids that are likely uh, still uh, dependents and, you know, might be going to college that the parents are on the hook to pay for. There's could be uh, uh, parents that are still alive that, that the family is now starting to take care of. They're starting to think about retirement and what that looks like. Um, there's, there's all sorts of complexity sort of in that space, which is, requires a lot of time and requires a lot of support. And that is a perfect client for us because that's what we have to give. And that's, that's really our, our wheelhouse. Anders, you, you, whether you knew it or not, you're describing me. So we're going to have to have a, a conversation after this. Great. <laughs> We'd love to put you through the process and get your feedback and see what you think. Um, let's stay on the client for a second. Then I want to turn to the advisor experience. So uh, in my view, there, there's not enough focus in this business around, you know, the, the ultimate measure of success, which is client outcomes, mm -hmm. um, right? We talk about production and we talk about, uh, you know, maybe the number of plans done, those types of things as firms try to move towards more of a planning approach. In, in your case, it's it's fully embedded in your in your DNA. Um, talk about that. You know, as you look at your clients and the kind of the journey you're on with them, how do you measure success from from the client perspective? It's a great question. So we, um, I'll give you our sort of culture first answer and then, and then I'll go deeper, but we actually have a channel, a Slack channel and, uh, in our, in our, at our company called dreams made possible. And every time that one of our planners helps a client achieve a goal, uh, they post it for the entire company to see, and we celebrate all of those as Love a team. It. Love it. Um, it's, it's really important, especially, and this actually goes back to the first point around building a virtual company when you're not in the office together every day, you need to have a something greater that ties you all together. That is really that connective tissue between you. And I think to a person, everyone who works at Facet is really fired up by our mission. And we genuinely in, in, our, in our, our heart of hearts believe that if you can help someone with their financial life, if you can put them on a better footing from a financial life standpoint, they will live a better life in general. Um, financial health is just as important as, as physical health. And so for us, we love to celebrate those, those small moments with, with our clients. The sort of more scientific answer is, are you familiar with um, like the agile development process? So, you know, it's this idea that instead of doing sort of a, a full project plan that sort of maps out, here's the starting point, here's the end goal, here's every step to get there. And then, you know, 18 months from now, hopefully we achieve that, uh, which by the way, sounds very much like an e-money or money guide pro financial plan. Um, you know, it's this idea that, okay, you have a start point, you have an end goal in mind, and then every week or two weeks you check in and say, okay, what's changed and how should we adapt over time? And so we're really sort of putting aside the whole business model change, putting aside the, the tech piece. 
I think our core innovation around is around a new kind of financial planning. We call it the best next step, but it really is, is rooted in this agile mentality, which is that your financial life is dynamic. It will change what, where you are today and where you are a year from now are two very different places. Uh, unexpected things happen. You make different decisions six months from now than you thought you would have made. I mean, COVID and uh, this whole pandemic is a great example. Like, you know, the you, worlds get turned upside down more frequently than we would think. And so having the flexibility to, um, to, to adapt to that and, and think about your financial life in sort of bite-sized chunks, that that I think is actually a way better way to think about financial planning than the sort of existing um, traditional way. So when you ask about how we measure success for our clients, we think about in terms of how many people are achieving their best next step and how many people understand the best next step. Have we done a good enough job of explaining like, hey, this is why insurance is really important right now for you. Um, and that's actually more important than thinking about saving for a boat or whatever it might be, or the flip might be, right? Where it's like, hey, you've actually worked a lot harder at saving than you might think. And you're in a position to do something crazy or some, you know, to, to achieve some, um, or, or, you know, have, have some, some sort of splurge expenditure that you didn't think that you could have. So that's how we think about it is, is these smaller bite-sized chunks that are really more tied to your everyday life, but ladder up to a much bigger financial picture. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I, I think advisors that can, you know, assuming you've got a client that's in decent financial shape, they're not underwater, they're not spending more than they're making. I, I think there's an awful lot that just, they want somebody to give them permission that's, that's grounded in data and, and people that, that, that look like them and what they've been through and the choices that they make and the, the trade-offs that they make, but, but permission to do more. We know so many people, I'm sure you know, we both have lots of, of family members and, and acquaintances, acquaintances, friends that, assuming they're not in the camp of, of just being you know, completely overspenders, they tend to not want to spend. They're just, they're scared to death. They're not going to have enough in retirement and just to do the things they want. They don't enjoy life when, yeah. when they can. Um, so I think advisors that they've got those kind of the, the tools and the way to explain things and, and guide, that is uh, the values off the charts. Can I, can I share a quick client story that I think really illustrates this point? Um, so we had a client who is, um, a, a woman in her mid sixties and she was working with one of our planners and she said, you know, th this just kind of came up in casual conversation. Um, my happy place is the beach and I haven't been to the beach in 20 years and I would love to go, but I just don't feel like I'm, I am, uh, in a place where I can, you know, really justify that expense. Mm -hmm. And our planner looked at her cash flow and said, no, actually you could go tomorrow if you wanted to. And three weeks later, they had another meeting, and it turns out that she went to the beach with uh, not only herself, but her two grandkids and sort of shared that experience with them. And we have a call recording where they're, they're both like crying on the phone together. Um, and, <laughs> oh, you know, it's awesome. a, it, I love that story because, first of all, it really is making dreams possible. It's also something I think that a lot of people don't think about when they think about what your financial planner can help you with. Right. I think everyone thinks about our oh, retirement and long term planning and long term goals. It's like, no, you can actually live a better life today. And I think, you know, you, you made the point exactly right around um, giving permission. And, you know, when you have an expert that's in your corner and is enabled by a bunch of great tech and great data to sort of help do this analysis very quickly and very efficiently, that's when you can make this magic happen. Absolutely. So in terms of the client experience, you, you talked about this, this upfront process. Um, what's, what's the volume looking like these days? Um, help help your, your colleagues in the advice business that are trying to, to run businesses and grow businesses, um, be altruistic for a minute. And, and in this environment, how do you do it effectively? Where, and where, where are clients coming from? Um, and maybe I want to, I, I did want to weave back into part of your origin around the partnerships with RIAs yeah. and what, what's the mix look like in terms of clients coming through that channel versus direct uh, end client marketing that you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> start with the sort of what, what volume's looking like. 
Um, it's interesting. I think two quick points. One is from a servicing standpoint, when we had all the crazy volatility in March and April, we actually didn't see a huge uptick in terms of number of inbound client requests. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that a lot of planning first advisors were in the same boat that right. if you do a good job of sort of explaining to clients, here's what your financial life looks like. Here's what financial look, look, life looks like when the market's down 30% and here's how you're on track for some longer term, bigger picture stuff. You can actually get out ahead of it and train your clients. And I think we were, we were in that camp, which has been great. Yeah. Um, we've actually doubled our onboarding rate in the last, basically since March, uh, we were onboarding about 50 clients a week. Now we're about a hundred. And, and that's I think, across how many advisors? Uh, right now we're at 47, I think. Um, we're adding planners on a, on a monthly basis. So, uh, I, sometimes I lose track, but I think I we're going to come back then to onboarding planners virtually. I'll come back to that, but yeah, for sure. But, but keep going. But so that's say that, say that stat again about the hundred. So, uh, we've gone from onboarding about 50 clients a week to a hundred clients a week. Yeah. And, um, and I think that there's two things there. One is that we have been, and there's a lot of content out there about us being a virtual first firm. So we have a, a leg up there. And I think when people are looking for a financial advisor, that really helps right now. And then I think the other thing is that the need for planning is really increasing and that there are a lot of people who need the help now more than ever. We're onboarding a lot of uh, single income households folks who had, uh, had that, that were dual income and now are single income and are trying to figure out how to navigate uh, a job loss. And so we, and we actually, some of our clients were affected by that as well. We, we launched uh, an internal program called Facet for Financial Hardship. And the idea was that if one of our clients lost a job or felt like they were no longer in a position where they could pay our fee, we basically <clears throat> reduced their fee by 95% for a three to six month period while we help them sort of navigate the job loss. And we built this whole module around, okay, you're unemployed. What does that mean? Like what are the very practical fast steps you can take to set yourself up for, for success there. And uh, so, so we had about 70 clients lose their, lose their jobs and um, about half of them uh, uh, we've, we've put on this fast financial hardship program. So that's been a very small thing that we've done, but I think we feel right. good about it because those are the people who actually need our help the most, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so that's that's kind of where where we are from a uh, you know how things have changed and and what's going on in the in the industry. How how, how are they those hundred a week? How are they finding you or and or you're finding them? So we work with a number of uh, of advisory firms and. Um, uh, basically, you know, companies that are generating a lot of inbound interest. So, um, you know, I'll give you a quick stat. There are about 5 million people who look for a new advisor every year, uh, just, just online. Um, and, you know, that's a combination of changing an existing relationship or entering the, the industry for the first time. Only about a million of those actually get placed. And the other 4 million aren't a good fit. Typically, they're too small for the, the traditional uh, wealth management industry to be interested in. So we basically partner with firms that are generating a lot of um, inbound prospects and you know 80% of them aren't a good fit for their business. Right. And, right. Uh, and so they send those over to us. Um, and so there's definitely been an uptick there. We've started seeing a big uptick in organic traffic to our site just as our brand has gotten bigger and, and out there more. Um, and you know we'll, we'll obviously continue to invest in that. And then the last thing that we've done, and um, this is a, a thing that I'm really excited about, is we've actually launched an employer offering. So we've uh, launched a combination of um, individualized coaching sessions. So employees can have one-on-one 30-minute -on -one, uh, coaching sessions with one of our CFPs. And then, um, and then some percentage of them elect to uh, become full planning clients as well. And we actually, um, we, we've, we've launched with uh, four employers and um, you know, seeing really great engagement. And in fact, one employer in particular um, has uh, there's a large tech company that did around the layoffs. Actually, offered uh, the coaching sessions as a as a um, as an employee ben or a, a benefit or a severance benefit. So, uh, so we're working with a number of furloughed furloughed and laid off employees as well. So, and that's a channel I expect to 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 grow pretty quickly. A lot of synergy. Yeah, financial wellness and employee wellness is a hot topic right now.
Yep. Generally, what size firms are, are you focused on there? Sort of, I would say uh, anywhere between 500 and 5,000 employees. Um, you know, a, a, those are big enough where we can work. You know, one of the things we do is we analyze the, the, the company's benefit stack. And that sort of is the starting point for the coaching sessions. And so anything under 500 or, you know, under 250 maybe, um, you know, there's a lot of upfront work that goes into that. And, you know, employee engagement is always a little tricky, right? So if you get 10%, is that, you know, really sort of worth the employer's time, worth our time? So, so it's sort of mid, mid size is, is where we target. Got it. Uh, I did want to come back to advisor onboarding, I guess, recruiting and onboarding. So you're looking for, I would imagine, um, like most aspects of your business, you're very uh, disciplined and, and, and regimented. So there's got to be a pretty stringent profile of the, the planners you're bringing on. So talk to me about that. And then in a virtual environment, which we're all in now, yeah. how do you how do you onboard them? How do you do? How do you teach them the culture? Uh, <clears throat> teach them the 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 facet wealth system and process. Yeah, no, those are those are great questions. So, in terms of sort of who we look to hire, we're really after folks who number one got in the industry to serve people and to help people live a better life. And so we never ask our advisors to do any sales or business development. We have a totally separate onboarding team that's doing all of that, okay. uh, all of that work. And so we're really looking for folks who are in it to serve and uh, in it for the planning, not the sales aspect. Um, also, we all obviously are a high volume business, right? Each one of our planners works with about 250 clients when they're sort of fully loaded. And so what we found is that folks that come from places like a Vanguard or a Schwab or sort of call center heavy environments where they might be answering an 800 number. They have their CFP, but they're very constrained in terms of the actual planning they can do. There's probably some asset allocation and maybe some retirement planning, um, but that's about it. You know, any other topic is sort of off limits. Mm -hmm. um, those are the folks that, that we love, right? They're, they're used to working with large numbers of clients. They understand the benefit of planning, but feel like they can't um, they can't really sort of flex their wings uh, and they don't have the autonomy that, that we give them. And then of course um, they get to work from home, which three months ago was a big selling point now, now less so. Um, and so, uh, so that's, that's definitely a target. We actually do, we probably do more disqualifying. We, we, we spend more time trying to persuade people not to come and work for us um, than to come and work for us because it's a very specific profile of person and, you know, we've definitely hired some people as we we're sort of learning that weren't a good fit. Um, you know, we hired a couple of people from like small independent shops that were more boutique -y, and that's just a very different model than, than what we do. Um, and so we, we then, then the, the sort of this, this flows into your next question, which is how do we think about onboarding them? I mean, what I described to you earlier was a different way of thinking about financial planning. So it's not let's get the full picture and develop a plan and, you know, get it all done. And then, you know, you're off to the races and I'll talk to you next year. Right. It's a very much ongoing collaborative sort of iterative approach. So there's a lot of sort of uh, unlearning that has to happen right. when someone comes and works for us. And so we spent a lot of time, we actually um, really in, in the first couple of weeks go very deep with our uh, product and technical teams who are rooted in the agile framework and sort of have them explain why the way that we do things is actually much more conducive to a more successful outcome. We use a lot of different examples. We bring it in the technical, uh, the, the technical development uh, methodology and, and um, you know, really help people understand this is a different way of doing things. It's, it's different than what you've been taught, but actually we believe this is the way of the future. So, um, so, so there's a fair amount of, of sort of, for lack of better word, indoctrination into the facet way of doing things that, that has to happen. And then, you know, in terms of, uh, of the virtual aspects, <clears throat> we're, we're, still, we're still working at it. And it's, it's difficult. Before COVID, we started, we, we, the first, everyone's first week would be in our Baltimore office and we hire in classes and, and in cohorts. So you'd have this, um, uh, you'd have this sort of like, you know, camaraderie that would happen organically because you'd have, you know, 10 or 15 people in the office at the same time. They're all starting on the same day. And 
Um, and you know, that still happens in a virtual environment, but you don't have the happy hours. You don't have the, you know, going to the Orioles game or whatever we might have, or going bowling or, you know, the, the sort of fun social activities. And we try and recreate that as, as much as possible, but you know, obviously you, you miss that in-person component. Um, but you know, our curriculum has, has sort of stayed the same and, and the way that we think about things is, has, has very much stayed the same. And, um, we've now onboarded, I think two or three classes virtually and, it seems to be working just fine. Fantastic. Um, let's take a advisor day in the life. So advisor comes in, you talked about, I think you said best next action. Best um, next step, yeah. Be best next step. So I'm an advisor, I come in, I've got my, my dashboard. How prescribed is my my day? What's that book like? It's a good question, and, and it's it's actually a question that we go back and forth on a lot. Which is, um, I'm a big believer in guardrails, not prescription. And so, on the one hand, you want to have a very clearly mapped and, and a clear set of standards for what your client experience looks like. Right? Every client should have a a minimum experience, both in terms of what the technical financial planning aspects are that they receive, um, but also the sort of relationship and what are the touch points that, uh, you know, that we have. By the way, I'm also a big believer that you can give value to a client outside of uh, the, a meeting with a CFP. And uh, especially when you're charging someone monthly and it shows up as a charge on their credit card, you got to figure out, okay, how are you showing that value, even if they, maybe they didn't talk to their CFP that month. Mm -hmm. So there's, we spent a lot of time thinking about that. Um, <clears throat> so you, so on the one you want to have this like clearly defined experience on the other, you also, we're hiring people who have, you know, significant credentials and, um, and have spent a lot of time, you know, building expertise around their, 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 their areas of focus. And so we don't want to limit them going back to the, sort of planner profile. We don't want to, to put them in a box and say you can only do these things. So <clears throat> it's a it's a constant balance to try and figure out what the right uh, what the, what that right level is. And and I'd say it's one that we're still um, we're we're still experimenting with. And each planner is a little bit different. And so you know we're really we're, we're still working out what that looks like at, at scale. Right. And, um, and it's definitely not a sort of, you know, one size fits all prescription for the, for the planner. Right. Yeah. One thing I'm talking to some of my consulting enterprise clients about is, is getting away from traditional, especially in this environment, uh, just geographically based matching of advisors and clients. So you're set up to, to be obviously non, non-geographic. Do you have a matching process where, you might have somebody on the team that specializes in you know, people going through divorce or uh, corporate executives versus uh, small business owners that have different types of planning needs. A anything along those lines? We do. Um, it's uh, I, like everything. It's this sort of constantly evolving sure. um, uh, process. But um, yeah, we we do have certain certain folks who have different uh, types of expertise. It's a, it's actually a hard sort of like linear programming problem to solve, right? If you're, if you have a hundred new clients coming in a week, you have 50 planners, you know, there's a calendar issue, which is how do you just match up who has availability, right? right. Um, and then when you have 50 planners is a relatively small N. And so you need to figure out, okay, like, uh, you know, how, how can you sort of map expertise to need, but also balance schedules and make sure that you know, one person doesn't get absolutely slammed. So again, it's an imperfect science, but yeah, we do think about that and, and we're running some tests right now actually around how we sort of double down on that because um, when we look at, uh, when, when we look at, at clients who leave us, right, um, you know, that, that we don't retain, there's definitely a, 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 a category of folks who are, uh, didn't get the the expertise that they were looking for. Didn't feel like their their planner was a good match for them. Typically, we can save those folks and match them with another planner, which is great. Mm -hmm. But there is more science that needs to be developed in the onboarding process to to make that happen. Got it. One thing we didn't uh, touch on, and as as we 
bring this to a close, I, I want to spend a second is, so you have some clients, you're providing asset management yep. as well, but within that overall subscription fee, I believe generally, but then others you don't, can you speak about uh, what that mix looks like? And, and I guess if they're not uh, managing their assets with you, what's that look like? Why wouldn't they, if it's part of the fee, how do you get visibility into that to help uh, obviously have, have that drive the, the plan? Sure. So right now it's probably a 50, 50 split of sure. clients that we manage money for and clients that we don't manage money for to those, for those that we do manage money for, we, there's no additional cost. We, we just include that as part of their subscription and, um, you know, obviously we pass fund fees through and that sort of thing, but right. you know, we're, we're very, very focused on low cost, passive, globally diversified. So, those aren't, um, you know, th those aren't that significant. Um, you know, to the extent that we don't manage people's money, I think there's a couple reasons. One is uh, they don't have assets to manage. So going back to that millennial okay. segment, we don't have, uh, you know, they're, they're folks that that uh, just don't have assets at all. Um, and uh, and then there's also people who have assets tied up in 401ks that we can't manage and we can certainly you know help them think about the right way to allocate those right. but we don't actually right. manage them ourselves um and then there are also uh sort of you know what's in the best interest of the client considerations for instance if someone is locked up in an annuity that might have a high fee associated with it but breaking that annuity contract would actually cost more than the money they would save um you know it's an unfortunate circumstance but it's we don't need to manage that money and so we're not going to make the client do something that's not in their best interest so that's kind of the the three buckets of of folks that wouldn't necessarily manage money with us interesting all right um i want to be respectful of your time and our, our viewers times i i routinely knock uh, these things that go on for hours so I, i'm gonna take my own medicine as much as i'd love to talk to you for another hour i'm gonna bring us to a uh, to a close I mentioned up front uh, personal capital. So similarities, but but differences also in terms of their model. They've got the whole um, you know, free uh, uh, PFM tools, a couple million clients that way, some percentage of, of which convert to, to an advised solution. Um, so I think they ended up somewhere 23, 24,000 clients. 12 to 13 billion in, in AUM and, and, and all the other users sold for a billion, you know, eight, 800 something million plus incentives to empower retirement. So obviously a lot of eyeballs on that. So I can't uh, avoid asking the question with that, freshly in the news and the similarities, what's the ultimate plan for facet wealth? What's the exit strategy? Is there an exit strategy? Yeah, for sure. So, um, so first of all, I, I have a lot of respect for the personal capital team. I've spent a fair amount of time with them over the years and really happy for that outcome for them. Um, and, uh, and there are definitely some similarities there. I think there are also some pretty key differences. Um, but without kind of going into, into that, you know, what is the, what's our plan? I mean, we want to build the next great financial services company. That's sort of the rallying cry internally. We see this enormous opportunity of millions, tens of millions of households that don't have great solutions when it comes to thinking about their financial lives. And this is where, you know, applying innovation to, uh, to, to an old solution can really lead to some amazing things. And so we're all in this for the long haul. Um, you know, we didn't talk at all about sort of the capital that we've raised, but, you know, we've raised close to 40 million bucks and, right. um, you know, our, our primary backer is Warburg Pincus and, you know, that, that's, that's very patient capital and, um, you know, visionary capital that's, that's in it to, to sort of build something really extraordinary and, re and really unique. So, uh, no plans to sell, no desire to sell, um, you know, hard to know if being a public company is really worth it these days, but, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly, you know, would love to be at that level and uh, and and have that have that optionality. And you know, we're here to to play in a big way. Fantastic, Anders. Thank you so much for the uh, the time today. Fascinating uh, journey that you're on. We'll we'll all be watching you uh, and see see what's next for you. So, uh, kudos on the success thus far, and thanks for the time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it.